Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. In the previous video on the Sun, we looked at the structure of the Sun from the central core out to the visible photosphere, but the Sun extends far beyond that. Today we're going to look at its atmosphere, including the solar wind, and discuss how we can safely and effectively study the Sun. In the last video, we learned that the Sun has a core where fusion takes place, a radiative zone and a convective zone that transfer energy to the surface, and a photosphere at the surface. Today we're going to start at the photosphere and move outward. The Sun's atmosphere actually extends a tremendous distance, well past Pluto's orbit. Voyager 1 was the first spacecraft to leave the heliosphere, as it's called, 35 years after launch. Because of these tremendous distances, our diagrams today won't be to scale. We'll start with the photosphere, at 100 kilometers thick, and 5,800 Kelvin. Its density is 10 to the minus 9 grams per centimetre cubed, just one millionth of atmospheric density at sea level on Earth. Next up is the chromosphere, about 4,000 kilometres thick. It's a bit cooler at first, at 4,000 Kelvin, but the temperature increases up to 100,000 Kelvin near the top. We're still not sure why this happens. The chromosphere's density is much lower, around one thousandth that of the photosphere at the base. Like Earth's atmosphere, its density decreases with altitude. Then we have the corona. We usually say the corona is millions of kilometres wide, but it's actually much bigger. This is the enormous atmosphere that Voyager 1 recently left. However, it gets very weak as you go further out. Near the Sun, its density is less than one millionth that of the photosphere although it reaches temperatures of around 2 million Kelvin. Again, the reasons for this high temperature are unclear, but we should know more in the next few years. Let's look first at the chromosphere. This true colour photograph reveals that the chromosphere, or colour sphere, is red. This is due to the presence of hydrogen. Other elements add different colours, but much less strongly. For example, a violet hue produced by calcium ions. The colours are produced when a hydrogen ion, a proton, regains an electron. A hydrogen atom will normally have an electron in the ground state, that is the innermost electron shell, called n equals 1. When a proton and electron recombine, the electron might not go straight to n equals 1. For example, it might go to n equals 3, where it still has too much energy. From here, it will fall down to a lower energy level. From n equals 3, it could go to n equals 2 or n equals 1. When the electron loses energy, it releases it as electromagnetic radiation. In the chromosphere, it's common for electrons to fall from n equals 3 to n equals 2 when recombining with hydrogen. This releases a wavelength of 656.28 nanometers, which is red visible light. We call this H-alpha radiation and we can study the chromosphere by using a H-alpha filter on our telescope. This blocks all light except for a narrow band around 656 nanometers. With some filters, it's even possible to look safely at the sun directly through a telescope, since they block most of the sun's light. But of course, read the manual before trying this. As mentioned, the corona is extremely large, but the visible part is only around a million kilometers from the sun's surface. The word corona is Latin for crown, and you can see why in these pictures. The corona's very low density means that even though it reaches temperatures of 2 million Kelvin, it doesn't have that much thermal energy, so it doesn't release much light. In fact, it's usually invisible against the harsh brightness of the photosphere. We can see the corona only if the main disk of the sun is blocked, either by the moon during an eclipse, or artificially with an opaque disk called a coronagraph attached to a telescope. Studying the corona can tell us a lot about the sun, and it's particularly useful for observing solar flares, which we'll come to shortly. It can be tempting to think of the sun as constant and unchanging, but that's far from the truth. It can be a violent place, emitting wind and intense solar flares. In the corona's extreme temperature, the ionised particles can reach speeds of nearly 1,000 km per second. This is greater than the sun's escape velocity, and charged particles spread out into space. This solar wind 
is mainly made of electrons, protons and alpha particles. These moving charged particles generate a magnetic field as they stream out through the solar system, affecting many things in their path. When the solar wind reaches Earth, the charged particles interact with our magnetic field. On entering the upper atmosphere, they excite and ionise the particles found there. In the same process that occurs in the Sun's chromosphere, when the atmosphere's ions regain their electrons, they emit light. This is called the aurora, and is beautiful to watch. Coloured streaks of light move and shift across the sky, mostly green, sometimes blue, and if you're lucky, red and purple. In case you're asked to describe the aurora in the exam, learn the phrase, shifting curtains of coloured light. Most of the solar wind doesn't reach Earth, our magnetic field deflects it into space. However, the interaction of several magnetic fields creates funnels, which send some of the particles down to us, creating the aurora. This can occur anywhere on Earth, but is most pronounced at latitudes 70 degrees to 80 degrees. In the northern hemisphere, they are called the northern lights, or aurora borealis, and in the southern hemisphere, they're called the southern lights, or aurora australis. The solar wind also strongly affects comets. When a comet gets close to the sun, the ice contained within heats up. Some of it vaporises, releasing steam, as well as dust when the steam cracks open the rocky parts. This forms an atmosphere around the comet, called a coma. The solar wind pushes the coma outward, away from the sun. The dust is pushed weakly away, leaving a dust tail which points partly in the direction the comet came from. The gas, however, becomes ionised, and so is affected much more strongly by the ions in the solar wind. The gas tail, or ion tail, points directly away from the sun. Incidentally, this loss of atmosphere occurs on all bodies in the solar system, not just comets. But some places, including the Earth, have protection against atmospheric loss, like high gravity or a strong magnetic field. The gentle solar wind is quite nice, giving us these pretty visuals but occasionally the sun gets violent and generates a solar storm. If this hits Earth, we get a geomagnetic storm. Remember from the last video that sunspots hold a tremendous amount of magnetic energy. If they collapse quickly, this can cause an explosion on the surface of the sun, releasing charged matter outward, a solar flare. This might cause the corona to release even more high-speed charged particles, a coronal mass ejection. The geomagnetic storm caused when one of these hits Earth is like the solar wind, but far more intense. The aurora are much more intense. Radio communications can be disrupted. Satellites can be damaged electrically or knocked out of their precise orbit, which can affect communication and GPS. Ground-based communication and electrical systems can be overloaded. In 1859, telegraph systems were knocked out. And in 1989, Quebec lost power for nine hours. And astronauts and high-altitude pilots receive dangerous doses of ionising radiation. We only see a solar flare days before it reaches us, which may not be enough time to evacuate the International Space Station. If a solar flare had hit the moon during the Apollo missions, the astronauts may well have been killed. However, solar flares also sweep out some of the ions that become trapped in Earth's magnetic field, such as the Van Allen belts. In the weeks following a geomagnetic storm, Astronauts are actually safer. Do not look directly at the sun. Even a few seconds can cause temporary damage to your eye, and any longer can cause permanent damage. Your eyes can't feel pain, so you won't know until it's too late. If you look at the sun through binoculars or a telescope, the focused sunlight can reach thousands of degrees Celsius, cooking your eye before you can even blink. Cameras are also very sensitive, and it's easy to destroy expensive equipment, as Alan Bean learned in Apollo 12 when he cut off the moon's first colour TV broadcast by pointing the camera briefly at the sun. However, we do have safe ways to observe the sun. We already discussed using filters on telescopes to block most of the sunlight. If you use this method, make certain that you know how to operate the equipment safely. Don't skip reading the manual. Much safer, as well as easier and cheaper, is telescopic projection. Get a large piece of thick card, a metre across if you can. 
Cut a hole for the telescope and attach the card around the telescope's barrel with masking tape or similar. Place some white card behind the telescope and aim the telescope at the sun. You'll see an image of the sun projected onto the card and you can move the card and telescope to bring it into focus. Don't look at the sun while you're aiming and absolutely don't use your telescope's finder scope. With practice, you can get some great images. Here we see a partial eclipse and sunspots projected onto a wall. There's also a cheap non-telescope method using a colander and a bit of paper. And finally, you should know that the sun looks very different when we use telescopes sensitive to different wavelengths. Visible light is great for sunspots. Ultraviolet is good for seeing the hot corona and solar flares. Infrared can reveal variations in the density of the photosphere. And radio waves let us study the sun's magnetic field. There are many layers to the sun's atmosphere, and we can study each of them using the right wavelength. If you've watched the previous video on the sun, you now know everything you need to know about the sun for the GCSE exam. I'll cover the formation of the sun, as well as its eventual fate, in a future video. Thank you for watching, goodbye, and have an excellent day.